The dream. It was clearer than a memory. And I heard the sound of thundering hooves, splintering shields and ringing swords. And I placed my air up on the Iron Throne. And all the dragons roared as one. I consider the matter urgent. That of your succession. Well, who else would have a claim? The firstborn child. Rhaenyra, no queen has ever sat the Iron Throne. The king has an heir, Daemon Targaryen. I will not be made to choose between my brother and my daughter. Rhaenyra's succession will be challenged. Knives will come out. You are the king. Your duty is to take a new wife. I have decided to name a new heir. I'm your heir. War is afoot. Do you think the realm will ever accept me as their queen? A woman would not inherit the Iron Throne. Because that is the order of things. When I'm queen, I will create a new order. Your family has dragons. There are power men should never have trifled with. If Rhaenyra comes into power, she can cut off any challenge to her succession. I am to inherit the Iron Throne. She will block my way. Our hearts remain as one. Oh, our hearts were never one. You can never imagine yourself on the Iron Throne. Where is duty? Where is sacrifice? Now they see you as you are. Welcome to The Grill, presented by Rap Pro. I am the Rap's Assistant Managing Editor for Audience, Adam Chitwood, and I am thrilled to be joined by House of the Dragon showrunner, Ryan Condal. Ryan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, so we're going to start off by, by asking a few questions we've been asking all of our innovators this year, and, and it begins with, what's the biggest hunch or bet uh, that has paid off despite everyone, what everyone has told you? Huh. Uh, I mean, making a Game of Thrones sequel prequel uh i mean honestly within <clears throat> within the within the construct of this particular show i think i think it was the the multiple time periods and 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 being able to uh tell that story uh cohesively uh seamlessly as far as it goes when you're recasting characters uh casting multiple sets of actors to play the same role all within the same season i mean i think we we uh looked at what the crown did <clears throat> and really admired it and i think it's one of the the shows that certainly I, as, as, as the showrunner, you know, and lead writer, uh, certainly when we were in the room, pointed to um, The Crown as, as one of our, our references in terms of the kind of drama that we were aspiring to um, to, to create. And I think an, an aspiration just in terms of the um, what I think is a high watermark in the art form. Um, and The Crown is very successful at uh, taking well-known uh, characters and then recasting them. Uh, they did, did it between seasons. We did it in the midst of the season. I think that was the big thing is is, is just doing it mid-season and with a brand new show and, and trusting that the audience would, um, you know, uh, sink their teeth into the characters and then stay with you as you as you swap them out. And uh, so far, I think it's uh, it's paid off. <laughs> I'd say so. Looking back over your, career, over your career, what's been your biggest mistake and, and what'd you learn from it? <laughs> uh i don't know i mean can i make a joke about not going and getting my mba um <laughs> I, I don't know i mean this business is a series of mistakes that you make i think along the way and and, and it, it it's a in many ways i think it's a um it's a pursuit uh, it's kind of a Zen pursuit where you're you're never going to quite achieve um, perfection, nirvana, 
but the, uh, the continual self-improvement and learning from things that you've done in the past that have, have not worked. And then also learning from things that have worked and continuing them as best practices as, as, as you move along. And I think, I, I you know, I, it's so hard to point at, you know, at, at one um, kind of sing, singular thing um, along the way. But I mean, my TV career began with a busted pilot that, you know, that we shot and made and that no one ever saw. So I think that in itself, um, was if, if we consider that a, I think that was a uh, many failures that led to a, a bigger failure. Um, I, but I think if that was the one of never wanting to find myself uh, there again um, and doing whatever I could do to, to not repeat that, <laughs> um, that would be the big, big one for me uh, in uh, at least in TV. Yeah. Well, uh, how has 2022 forced you to innovate in ways you didn't expect? Uh, I mean, this whole COVID thing was a real doozy uh, through, you know, through all production. I mean, thankfully, now it seems like most of the things that really uh, held us up, I think, in the in the making of season one, the, the you know, the, the writing, the prep, the making of season one, because it all, you know, COVID happened in the midst of our writer's room, you know, the, 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 the declaration of the pandemic and all that. So really through every phase of the show, we we dealt with it. We dealt with it in casting, not being able to see actors in the room live. We dealt with it um, certainly in pre-production, not being able to be in the room with the artists and designers that were building your sets. And uh, and then in, in actual production, <clears throat> all the limitations that came along with that, not being able to meet people or get to know them because half their face was covered. Uh, and then multiple shutdowns and things like that. So I think, I think it's just, it's just sort of figuring out, you know, we're very adaptable people, us humans and, you know, taking the, the things that you've learned from uh, doing this job and then figuring out, okay, well, I have to live without that. So how do, how do I do that better? And then, and then, uh, and then moving on. Um, I think the exciting thing about, you know, 2022 is now, as we kind of come into the end of it is, is moving on into what apparently appears to be, uh, the positive next phase of, of life and movie making, which is a little bit more normal and get, being excited, frankly, to just get back to um, the quote unquote regular business of filmmaking with uh, everybody in the room and being able to see their faces. <laughs> uh, whose work has, has really inspired you either inside your field or outside of it? Um, I mean, I grew up really loving movies uh, in particular. Um, for me, uh, you know, certainly George Lucas and all that he accomplished um, in, you know, certainly, you know, Star Wars. But I think just him as a, an innovator in, a, in, his, in his own right. And I think I think I always loved George Lucas as a as a, as a fan and a uh, and, um, you know, a, a nerd. But I think I think once I started doing this for a living and realized all the things that he did, the things that you don't necessarily credited him with like building ILM, inventing so many kinds of special effects, you know, the, the, the technology that he had to invent just to make Star Wars. I think those are the things that I, as a, a producer, uh, really came, really came to admire. And, and those are the people that I sort of gravitate to, you know, James Cameron, uh, certainly along that list, you know, John Milius was always somebody that I really looked up to as a screenwriter. Um, and then on the TV side, I think I look to, you know, more kind of recent peers in the sort of, you know, quote unquote, golden age of television or the new golden age of television. Um, you know, David Milch and David Simon and um, David Chase, that all the Davids, um, certainly, uh, uh, Matt Weiner and the in the creation of Mad Men, uh, those are the TV series that, for me as a movie fan, somebody that really pursued movie making wholeheartedly. When I started seeing those as a uh, as a budding screenwriter, <clears throat> those were the things that made me want to get into long form uh, TV making and uh, and you know tell these uh, kind of movie scale stories on a on a, on a, a longer timeline, um, be able to live in with the characters and the drama in a bit a uh, bit more in depth way than you would be able to do in a two hour feature. This is not on the list, but it must be asked. What's the best Star Wars movie? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's got to be the original, right? I mean, A, a New Hope or Star Wars, I think, is, as fans from 19, 1977 would remember, remind you that it was called. Um, that because that was the that was the innovation that that was that was that was the one that that broke the mold. It, it took this very bleak period in um, in American history. Um, I think in the in the late seventies and also in in kind of movie making um, a really interesting period because we were making all these films like uh, you know uh, Taxi Taxi Driver and all the President's Men and Network. And um, and Lucas, you know, brought a more optimistic um, bent to, to that to kind of counterpoint, counterpoint the movies that have been made for the last decade. And I think I think that um, 
that leap forward in um, genre storytelling and, and making it a high art form the way Kubrick had done with 2001. Um, that had to be, that had to be, that's the one that, that it, it changed film more than um, the jazz singer did, I think. So that, yeah. that was the big one. Uh, and if you could go back to the start of your career, what advice would you give yourself? Uh, stay at it. <laughs> I think, you know, I think I would, I would always say that I always en envied, um, you know, doctors and lawyers because they had an incredibly hard job that took years and years of schooling, but there was a set path to it. Really, if, if you really wanted to become a doctor, uh, you could, uh, you know, Sit, sit, get into the trenches and study, you know, study the material, prepare for the tests, um, take the extra cor courses, read books, meet with mentors. And you, and you, in theory, if you could pass everything, uh, you, you would get there. There was a path to it. I think with this, um, it was such an, it's such an unknown thing. Everybody has a different uh, breaking in story. Um, and then so many people break in and then wash out later, which I always felt, I felt like that was the, the more heartbreaking tragedy is the worst, worse than breaking, never breaking in is breaking in and then, and then washing out and not being able to hang on to it. And I think that was always the fear that I had after I broke in. So I think that would be the thing I would just go back and tell, tell myself and, uh, you know, 15 years ago, just to stay at it. And it was all going to be okay. Cause I think <laughs> just the confidence of knowing that, okay, it's going to be a lot of work and there gonna be ups and downs, but but, you know, you'll hang in. I think that would have um, removed a lot of anxiety and probably added a lot of hair to my head over the years. <laughs> Speaking of that, uh, let's jump into the Houses of the Dragon. Uh, you know, in terms of innovating, I'm curious what kind of pressures you felt on the early days of the project, because I think you you pitched Duncan Egg first, right? For it kind of became what it is now. So, you know, I what did. Pressures like? Yeah, I pitched. I mean, I, 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 Everybody at this point knows that I was a you know unapologetic uh, uh, super nerd for uh, George R. R. Martin's uh, world, and I you know I read his books multiple times, um, and I um, particularly Duncan Egg, which I other than the original books uh, was my favorite thing of his, and it happened in Westeros, and it was a different story. It's a completely different um, uh, tone and feeling, and. Years before I actually got this job, I had pitched that to HBO when they first started investigating, hey, what are we going to do when Game of Thrones comes to an end? What's the next series? Um, and uh, HBO had come to me just because I had re read the reputation around town of being an unapologetic <laughs> super nerd <laughs> in George R. R. Martin's world. Um, and I just, I, I still, frankly, love the idea of that story as a counterpoint to um, the original Game of Thrones and frankly to what we're doing because it just is a, uh, it's more of a lone wolf and cub. It's, it, it is more of the Mandalorian versus the, uh, you know, the original Star Wars where it's just, it's, it's two, two guys making their way through this very um, complex and dangerous and highly political world that aren't necessarily political themselves, which I thought, what I always thought was interesting as a, an adventure tale to tell with the Westeros. Um, but then, you know, uh, once House of the Dragon came along, I, you know, I think, um, you know, the, the, that was more real immediately, I think, because it, it it became a it went from oh this is interesting to oh my god I think they're actually going to pursue making this very quickly, <laughs> which is great. But then uh, I think the the pressure is just realizing that you have to follow the Beatles and um, how the hell do you follow the Beatles? And the answer is you just you don't you make your own thing and hope that people will come along and watch it. Well, and something that, that's really exciting about House of the Dragon is that it, it centers two women at the center of its story. And I was wondering if you could talk about the decision behind not only that, but also centering women behind the camera. You know, you have Claire Kilner directing. Um, it's very, you know, following up Game of Thrones, you want it to be different but similar. And this is one way in which this feels distinct from, from the more ensemble, larger world of Game of Thrones. Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, that is it. I mean, this is the, you, we we have long said that this is a um, whereas the, if the original Game of Thrones is a is a sprawling uh, Homeric tale, this is really more of a Greek tragedy. A tragedy. This is more of the uh, you know a a, play, a Plato drama um, about one family tearing itself apart. So it, it lets you live in with individual characters more intimately than you would be able to in the original series, simply because. You have to service more characters because it's this very um uh it's a it's a, a story of diaspora and following characters all over the all over the map as they slowly come back together whereas this starts with characters and they're together and then slowly breaks them apart um 
there are two women at the center of it. Um, I would say that was kind of baked into the DNA of the story. Um, the very first uh, novella that George ever published out of the Targaryen history uh, was called The Princess and the Queen. And it, it, um, it told the story of Rhaenyra and Alicent as adults, Alicent as her stepmother, having married her father after having grown up together at court. So th those, those things were always built into it. I think what we did was decided to go back deeper into their history and tell the story of these these uh, two women as, as uh, young girls and make them peers that had grown up together and were quite fond of each other and had you know had a close friendship only to have it broken apart by the male pressures around them the pressure of the patriarchy particularly their fathers who are both have political responsibilities in their life and in this world where marriage is um, duty and power um, seeing how those those pressures get applied to them in their lives and then seeing how it how it busts them apart. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that was always, uh, frankly, part of this. I think us, you know, centering on it um, was the correct thing to do because it is, as you said, different from uh, what the original series presented. And I think, I think the success of of House of the Dragon, if if I have to put my finger on it, is offering up the same thing but in a different way uh, to Game of Thrones because people come to Game of Thrones now expecting a certain thing. They expect high political intrigue. They expect interesting uh, gray characters who do unexpected uh, but totally set up things all the time. And, um, and, uh, and they, they want, they want uh, su surprising storytelling. And I think, I think that comes from um, cent centering on uh, really, really hopefully well-drawn characters that you spend a lot of time with and get to know and then get horrified when they um, start making um, uh, questionable decisions. And was it a conscious decision on your guys's part to to have female directors come in and handle some of these episodes that are dealing with, um, you know, sex and intimacy, you know, issues like that? Yeah. So, yeah, that was always really important uh, to me, to us, uh, to HBO, to have um, uh, a fully represented uh, cast and crew in the show in front of and behind the camera. And um, I mean, my writing partner in the show, uh, Sarah Hess, who uh, made no secret about I could not have done the show without her. Um, she was the very first person that I recruited uh, in in the building of the of the writing staff because I knew I was making a show about two women. I I have uh, I have a wife. I have two daughters. I think um, I have I have. I have forged uh, through the female experience quite a bit as a man, but I am still a man. And I think it's important to um, see that perspective from the inside of somebody that, um, you know, uh, was, a, you know, grew up a woman and was a mother and, and had all these experiences that I, I could not, uh, I, I have seen from the outside, but not experienced internally. And, and I think it started there. And then in the filmmaking, certainly we, you know, wanted us uh, to be able to tell a similar story. We had, uh, it's a show that involves uh, multiple marriages and childbirths. Uh, it involves the coming of age of these two, two, you know, women and girls. And I think I had some things to say there as a storyteller, but I think having those other perspectives in the mix always makes the story more rich and, um, and, and textured and, 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 you know, frankly, uh, you know, uh, Claire, wonderful director, Gita Patel, uh, who directed episode eight, um, had just be, just become a mom for the first time herself coming into our show, <laughs> multiple <laughs> horrific childbirths. And uh, although she didn't uh, film one herself, did have uh, something to say about it. Um, Sarah's mother uh, had, uh, had had gone through a childbirth and had lots to say about about that subject and making the childbed a battlefield and all those themes that have come out in, in season one. And, and, and you know, my um, my ability ability to um, tell stories as a, uh, you know, as a, as a fantasist at some point does, uh, you know, you do need that, you do need that real perspective, whether you're, you're doing research or, or, or whatever it is on a, on a, you know, on a medieval battle or, or, a, or in uh, midwifery, um, you want, you want that, you know, real experience on the ground and what that it was actually like, because it, it always makes it more, feel more real. Well, the, I mean, the show, again, speaking of innovation, the show is also diverse uh, from a race perspective. And I'm curious about the decision to make the Valerians black. Was that as simple as saying, like, listen, we don't want an all white cast in, in this show? No, I think, I, you know, I think uh, it was not that simple. And I think I think the reason that it's been a successful choice, frankly, I mean, you're never going to not everybody's ever going to be happy. But the reason it was successful is because it was thought out. It wasn't just done perfunctorily or doesn't want, it wasn't just done to tick a box or to, you know, to be uh, to be seen as progressive or to be seen as, as, as somebody that's, uh, you know, 
cut you know covering off on the bases or anything like that we we wanted it, it's it's 2022 uh it's it's a, it's a different era than um these shows used to be made in um we have an incredibly diverse audience that's in not only uh across america but in multiple countries that are uh, speak all sorts of different uh languages that um that you know uh, represent all you know all kind of all the all the colors under the sun and it was really important to see some of that reflected up on screen this is a fantasy world um i think if this was a historical fiction piece it would be a, you know it would be a, a more um uh nuanced discussion but i think simply because this is a fantasy world we with if we believe in dragons and shapeshifters and direwolves we can believe that everybody in the story is not white right. um and why we went to the valerians in particular was because that felt like the most fantastical race in in the show and it felt like this was a these were a people from a lost continent that we don't really know that much about we know they all have silver hair we know they have an affinity for uh for dragons some of them and we know they are seen as you know as as quoted in the books and in the show closer to gods than to men so what you know what does that all look like and um it always stuck with me this this article that um where uh, george had talked about at first when he set out to write these books considering making all of the valerians black and that um just just as a way of you know black uh, a race of black people with silver hair and that always really stuck with me as an image and i said well you know valeria was this you know enormous uh continent very you know diverse and well populated uh nation that fell into the sea why couldn't there have been a line of black valerians in that you know in that story and in in in, in this particular time period, we're not all that far removed from the doom, it would be believable. And I think if you're willing to take that first sort of, you know, uh, leap of suspension of disbelief, um, you really come to, it feels integrated and, and, and um, intrinsic to the show in a, in a, in a organic way. Uh, to me, I mean, I don't even, uh, I don't even really think about it anymore. And it, it, it it's, there are so many Valerians in the show, having the Valarian family, having the Sea Snakes family um, uh, look different than the Targaryens is actually really helpful in the casting and in differentiating people on screen and remembering who's from who's from what house and maybe <laughs> making it even clearer that you know Rhaenyra's children are of questionable parentage. Um, I think there's a lot of visual benefits that come along with it, and because Corlys has such a rich and diverse uh, family line himself, um, just simply making that one turn on him to um you know to cast steve Toussaint, his entire family becomes then a diverse cast and it's a really interesting way to um populate the show with a bunch of different um faces that you may may not have seen in a, another high fantasy show or in the original series yeah well i wanted to ask about audience because now the show is out and people love it like the critics love it the fans are are digging it but i'm curious from your perspective as a writer when you are working on something that is meant to be consumed by an audience and meant to be presumably liked by them. How do you balance that with trusting that you are telling the right story, you are making the right decisions, especially with something like House of the Dragon, which it is a built-in franchise. You know people are going to have opinions about it because they were very vocal about Game of Thrones. So how do you how do you just personally balance that pressure? I, I really, I do, I, I imagine a lot of people in my seat say they try not to think about it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, uh, the pat answer and say, I try not to think about it. I mean, the easiest answer is, look, I'm, I am a huge fan. Uh, I think that is clear, uh, if not from the thousand of other interviews that I've done uh, from this, from this conversation too. I'm a huge fan. Um, I take this world really seriously. It was really important to me as a, a fan of science and fiction and fantasy, as a, as a budding writer. Um, this is, I found these books when I, when I myself was trying to figure out how to um, uh, work in storytelling as an, as an art form uh, myself. Um, and the, and they were hugely influential on me. And really, I mean, I don't, I honestly don't know whether I'm, I'm sitting here if I had not discovered those books when I did. Um, so when I say that these are incredibly important to me and, and George is incredibly important to me as, um, as a, as an author and as a mentor and as an artist that I looked up to, and now as a friend and now as a, now as a co-creator and a partner in this, um, I want to take care of his, his children. Um, and 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 look after them, and I want to do good service to them to not only honor him and the work that he's done, but also honor the 
tens of millions of fans that he has of his of his of his books and and of the original show that are all there because of him and i take that on with um uh, i i do not take that lightly um so for me if i'm making the series that i think that i want to see and experience as a fan and i'm doing something that i like and i am happy with and contented by then i think that that was that that was always the bar that i set for myself make the series that i would want to see as a fan and um the rest will kind of fall into place and so far it feels like that approach fidelity to george's material making the changes where you need to in order to adapt it to a screen medium has um has paid off now you just have to do it again for season two. <laughs> easy peasy well now it's easier because uh <laughs> yeah we've cast the show and i don't have yeah. you know four different time periods to tell the show yeah. in um so season two becomes uh becomes fun instead of a uh instead of an anxious um you know climb up up to a a summit that um you know might throw you off when you get to the top <laughs> well you know we know miguel's not coming back for season two how are you finding uh being sole showrunner on on season two which i know is not your first go around i know you have experience yeah but look i mean this show is bigger than anything that uh, uh i've ever done it's frankly it's bigger than anything anything other than david and dan have ever done i mean they're the only ones that i think yeah. have experienced something this at this level but you know maybe rings of power maybe some of these other series that are are, are starting to come in and all respect to those showrunners because god this is a uh, really big hard job um i uh I, you know Thankfully, I have the experience of, of season one behind me. Um, I learned a lot in the making of it. I have a wonderful team uh, around me, um, uh, a bunch of uh, great uh, directors and heads of department and artists and writers that have, that have helped. And I'm really just going to lean on them to um, you know, help uh, service the vision that we set out to create in season one and to continue into season two. You mentioned Rings of Power. I, it was curious that these shows came out at the same time. And I'm curious, just speaking to you as, as someone on quote unquote team House of the Dragon, how did that feel from your perspective? It, was it, did it feel like a bit of a Team Marvel, Team DC thing? Or was it, you know, the more people watching fantasy, the better? Yeah, I mean, the second one. I, I you know, uh, I, um, I, I, I'm a, I, I'm a huge unapologetic Tolkien fan too. Surprise, surprise. Um, I, I read <laughs> Lord of the Rings and Silmarillion and The Hobbit multiple times through uh, growing up. I saw the Peter Jackson movies multiple times in the theaters. Um, yeah, I, I love all that stuff. I love high fantasy. And frankly, I want to live in a world where there is room for all of these things to exist if they're good. Um, uh, I think, I think uh, the need for more um, well-made um uh, expensive science fiction and fantasy on television is is what all of us nerds want, and um, I you know I, I I I don't think that somebody watching Rings of Power means that they're not watching House of the Dragon. I, I just I don't see it that way. I see I see uh, one you know one feeds the other, and I think the more um, good quality genre entertainments on television, the more it's going to draw in the general public who might not uh, be so predisposed to watching this. I mean, I think we have to remember back to when Game of Thrones aired, there was a lot of resistance around, you know, sort of normies <laughs> watching that <laughs> yeah. show because yeah. they thought it was, they thought it was, you know, silly or goofy or like they didn't, you know, they, they oh, with the fantasy thing with dragons and direwolves and whatever, but they got sucked in by the, by this, the, the adult way in which um, George and David and Dan told the story, um, the the surprising turns in it, the way it the way it, it actually turned fantasy on its ear. It, you know, George, as a huge Tolkien fan, actually takes a lot of Tolkien's. Um, if not, they weren't tropes when Tolkien wrote them, but they became tropes over the decades when everybody else tried to ape Tolkien and um, and turn and turn them on their head and and surprise people in a way. And that's what drew people into the show. So I think building off of that idea and. <clears throat> taking this much more willing audience. People are much more willing now in 2022 than they were in 2011 to, um, you know, put a, uh, <laughs> put a, a, a Targaryen uh, a flag on the, uh, on the uh, back of their car uh, or to, uh, to admit that they watched the show at the water cooler at the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the hedge fund or whatever, whatever it is. It just, it, this is made fantasy mainstream. And I think the more of these good high quality shows that come along, make fantasy more mainstream, and then just it makes a bigger audience. It means more, you know, more of these shows can be made and, and be made in an interesting way. That's not just, um, popcorn mass entertainment and something hopefully has something interesting to say. And with the support of studios who are giving it the production value it, it deserves. 
to, to serve. Correct. Them. Correct. And as we know, these shows are not cheap to make. Um, and they're, they're, they're dangerous ventures because you have to invest a whole lot of money in upfront to figure out whether it works or not. So we want, yeah. you know, we want studios in a, in a, uh, in a will, willing to take risk mode. We don't want them in a risk adverse mode because that's yeah. where good art comes from. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I think Georgia said this is somewhat of a close ended story and unlike Game of Thrones, you know, the book of this is finished. How long do you see this running? Is it, is it a couple more seasons? Is it, you know, a longer series? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that this series um, has as much uh, mileage to be mined out of it. Um, this particular story, the one that I'm telling right now, The Dance of the Dragons, um, as the original series, it's just it doesn't have um, it doesn't have that that uh, breath to it. Um, not to say it's any less interesting. I mean, I think it's it's a it's a really great series. But I think also part of making a series is knowing when to drop the curtain on it and to 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 uh, to call it an call it an end. Um, but I've always said the show is called House of the Dragon. It's not called the Dance of the Dragons. And I think there is a very rich 300 year Targaryen dynasty to mine many stories out of. And that that is the thing that I think is the most promising for the future of uh, fans of, of Westeros is that George has written some deeply complex history uh, that's three centuries long that begins with Aegon's Conquest, actually begins at, before Aegon's Conquest with the story of the Targaryens leaving uh, old Valyria because of the dream of one little girl. I mean, there's there's so many stories to be mined out of there um, that I think uh, as as long as there's a willing audience, there is there is plenty of uh, Targaryen to come. Well, let's hope they're all as good as House of the Dragon. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much uh, for letting me chew your ear off and uh, taking part in this panel. We super appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> I appreciate it.